so hello viewers uh, welcome to this special edition of Kalimpong television's presentation is a tibetan writer a tibetan poet freedom fighter and an activist that the world recognizes we're very honored to have a mistress the very popular amongst the tibetan youth and the tibetan community Tenzin Sundu, welcome to Kalimpong and Kalimpong Television. Thank you, sir, for your time. Uh, so what brings you to Kalimpong, during the pandemic especially? Well, I've been on a speaking tour. Uh, I've been traveling all across the Himalayas, uh, the Indian part of the Himalayas. I've started from Ladakh and then traveled through Himachal, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar. Mm -hmm. And from Siliguri, I went up to uh, Sikkim. I traveled through different um, parts of Sikkim and n now here mm -hmm. in Kalimpong and then Darjeeling. And my last leg of this Himalayan journey will be in uh, Arunachal yes, Pradesh. So what I'm doing through these speaking tours is I'm uh, highlighting the issue of Tibet and cautioning the Indian population mm -hmm. about the rising threats from China. Mm -hmm. So that brings walking the Himalayas campaign. So I call it walking the mm -hmm. Himalayas. Of course, I'm taking a local, uh, you know, facility to travel, mm -hmm. maybe a shared taxi mm -hmm. or bus or sometimes even hitchhike and, hitchhike. and travel. Um, but ultimately, when you actually go to the village, mm -hmm. go to the people, you have mm -hmm. to walk. Mm -hmm. And Correct. it involves a lot of mm. walking and that to it high Himalayas mm. in remote villages, mm -hmm. places where uh, in some places there is no electricity, in mm -hmm. some places there is no proper route and, mm -hmm. and we walked and we met with people and that meeting of people mm -hmm. and, and talking to them, that mm -hmm. is walking the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. So what has your experience been interacting with the people ever since you started this campaign? It's a long process of learning for mm. me um, and, uh, and so much of unlearning mm. also. There are many general stereotypes mm. we have mm. about what's called the Correct. Himalayas and mm. mountain people um, and also about language and culture. Mm. Uh, we used to look at Lahore, Spiti, Kinor in one bracket. Mm. But when we actually go and travel to mm. certain villages, mm. you see their dialects are different, mm. they eat different Correct. food, they're dress uh, costumes are different so it's been such an exciting roller coaster mm. journey mm -hmm. meeting people learning so much mm -hmm. about it um, and sometimes you feel that you have you have taken so much mm. and you are not able to digest mm. because it's such a, a long journey and also you know I'm taking a day or two mm. in one big village or a town or a city mm. um, so it's a very very hectic journey mm. Mm, but very exciting um, and lots of things to learn yes, yes. Uh, so you're born in 1975 in Manali Dharamsala so can you tell me about the your birth because uh, we read uh, you on the roadside your parents coming right. from Tibet the entire story mm. can you can leave some up so what had happened was uh, when the when the Chinese invasion of Tibet happened uh, many Tibetans had to leave their home and come to India uh, seeking asylum following his holiness the Dalai mm. Lama my parents also escaped Tibet mm. and when they were crossing the border into India they were themselves teenagers mm. And uh, the first thing uh, the Tibetan refugees did coming into India for their livelihood mm. was uh, working in the road construction labor. Mm. And that happened in Ladakh, Himachal, mm. in Sikkim also, mm. and some parts in Arunachal. Mm. Uh, so my parents were road construction laborers mm. in, in Kulu Valley. Okay. So they used to be based in Manali, mm. but worked uh, on the way from Man from Mandi, Kulu, Manali, Rotang Pass, Kelong, mm. and then go further, uh, Baralachala, Taglanla, all the way to Ladakh. Mm. So that important that stretch of road, mm. which is now important for Indian tourism and also for Indian army, mm. that was built by the Tibetan refugees. Mm. 
so my parents were working there mm. and my mother tells me that that bit of the that stretch of the road from uh, Koksar uh, entering into the Garsha Valley, uh, Lahol Valley mm. up to Kunzumla, that bit of the road. Now there's hardly anything mm. left, but that was built by uh, Tibetans. Um, my mother tells me that mm. I was born in a tent mm. on the roadside Kuli camp. Yeah. in a place called Baradhara. But mm -hmm. when we uh, passed through mm -hmm. the, that area this time, there wasn't a single soul living there. There's nothing yes. there. It's just rocks mm. and rocks. Mm. Um, so, I don't know. It, it's it's almost kind of a fairy tale kind of mm. story where you come from a place mm. which is full of rocks and mm. there's not a single mm. soul there. So, uh, this is the story of most Tibetan refugees, mm. uh, you know, born in India, mm. uh, my generation. Mm. Now, of course, uh, the third generation who are now going to school and college, mm. they are born to my generation. Correct. So, you see, we have three generations mm. of, mm. uh, uh, of, of Tibetans living uh, in India now. And also, many of them have gone abroad mm. to Europe and America. So, in fact, you're born on the road. So, from the road to the present activism it's been a long journey so can you tell me something about the schooling yeah um, <clears throat> hmm. um, I studied in a typical Tibetan uh, refugee school uh, mm -hmm. this was in uh, Kulu Valley okay uh, it's a very small school for 250 kids mm -hmm. and um, I think one of the first learnings in the school was we were told that we don't belong to India okay mm. and that we all Tibetans mm -hmm. eventually we will go back to our own country mm -hmm. Tibet mm. and that was shocking to me mm. to learn that you are not a citizen or you don't belong to the country you mm. are born into and your country is somewhere else mm. now for a 10 year old okay. boy with that kind mm. of you know pride mm. suddenly you are shattered right. and I think that was perhaps the first serious lesson mm. in my life uh, to feel mm. that you are living at someone mm. else's sympathy in a way an outsider in a way yeah, yeah. suddenly you are estranged mm. Mm. by the country you are born into mm. but it also gave me the purpose yes, of life very, very true that I have mm. to fight for the freedom of Tibet mm. and uh, that has been my first inspiration in life mm. freedom mm. freedom of Tibet mm. um, and therefore um, this entire life mm. uh, of schooling and college and and later and now even uh, as an activist and also as a mm. writer the idea of freedom is so very inspiring mm. to live for okay. and uh, it's an unquenchable thirst mm. um, and never-ending journey mm. because it's a process of freedom. Correct. Which is the school that you went to? So this is mm. a, a Tibetan children's village school. Uh, um, firstly, it, the primary schooling was in uh, Kulu Valley. There's mm. a place called Patlikul. Okay. Uh, and then my um, uh, class 10 and 12th was in TCV Dharamshala. Mm -hmm. Then I did my BA from Madras, so uh, Lo Loyola College. Uh, yes. So, uh, pursuing your higher education. Yes, yes. Uh, you're interested in literature. So, you went to uh, Chennai University to do your bachelor's, I think. Yes, yes. Then, master's in University of Mumbai. Bombay. Uh, can yes. you talk about this journey where you got into literature and you met stalwarts like Dilip Chetri, mm. Arun Kulatkar, mm -hmm. spins like uh, Sanjana Kapoor and yes. Alec Padam say and mm -hmm, so on. Mm -hmm. Can you give us this wonderful story of mm. higher education? Well, uh, you know, from childhood I had always wanted to write and speak because that's our only weapon mm. to tell our story. Correct. Uh, the Tibetan freedom struggle does not involve carrying guns and mm. hiding mm. in the jungle and the, you know, we are freedom fighters, that kind of thing. I think this great sense of mm. pride and honesty in this in this freedom struggle led by His Holiness mm. the Dalai Lama. It's a non-violent freedom struggle. Mm. 
we are speaking to the conscience of the people around the world even mm. though when they see their economic interests in china mm. but they are convinced uh, that the truth lies with the, the tibetan people and they mm. have suffered so much mm. i think the power of telling the tibetan story was so very important mm. and and we understood that so very uh, when when we were really young mm. uh, so i always mm, aimed to become a writer uh, from childhood mm. uh, but in our school we didn't have a library okay. so mm -hmm. i learned my first lessons in english language mm. uh, from tingle comic books okay um uh, uh, tingle comic books that that in a, in the in the bazaar mm. in patlukul bazaar we used to um rent it for 25 paise so I think uh, those were my first serious mm. lessons and also being resourceful. Correct. You know, mm. you were in class four and class mm. five and you are educating yourself. Mm. You, are, you are telling yourself that this is mm. the path mm. uh, for you and for your country mm. and the freedom struggle you want to pursue. Mm. Um, I went to uh, Madras, mm. uh, did my BA from Loyola College. Okay. Uh, University of Madras mm. and, and and also uh, MA from Bombay University. Mm. So these were, you know, really coming out of the community kind of mm. education uh, mm. for me. So my basic English uh, language education was uh, from Loyola okay. um, and my writing started mm. from Bombay University. And mm. that's the time when I met with I was really fortunate that mm. I was there at the time when some of the stalwarts of mm. Indian writing in mm. English, uh, like Dom Mores, mm -hmm. Adil Jasavala, mm -hmm. Arun Kolatkar, mm -hmm. Dilip Chitre, all the, all of these uh, people were there, and mm. I I was I was friends with them. Okay. Nisim Izikil used to correct some of my writings. Oh, okay. uh, so so that, these mm. are really fortunate moments for me as a Tibetan refugee mm. who had no real Correct. background or mm. res, uh, you know resources i was able to be there at the time uh, when all these were there um, so i start <clears throat> really started to uh, write uh, poetry and also uh, my prose writings uh, from bombay much later because English, yes of course you learned later yes um, mm -hmm. you know as a writer you know i started very late firstly because i didn't have the language uh, mm -hmm. enough to write mm -hmm. Um, and and also the just the general ambience in mm -hmm. where you start to write and share your writings with other writers mm -hmm. and they would give uh, you know feedback mm -hmm. those are so very important uh, for someone to really uh, get into writing mm -hmm. so after completing your education uh, your activism really started in the school days you believe like Tibet needs to be free and in fact uh, the world recognized you for the first time in Mumbai I think in 2002 Yes. When you kind of protested, yes. the global yes. audience was yes. there. Uh, can you tell me about that 2002 incident mm. where your activism really mm. uh, moved forward? Mm. 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 Well, uh, that happened in 2002 when the Chinese mm. uh, Prime Minister Zhu Rongji was visiting Bombay mm. and he was staying at the Oberoi Hotel, mm -hmm. which is now called Hilton and different other names changed, but that was the tallest building in Bombay okay. and he was staying in that building and uh, We had arranged about 500 Tibetans to come down to Bombay uh, City to sit on a one-day uh, token hunger strike mm. uh, But I had other plans uh, because I knew that you know even if you have 500 people sitting in the roadside in a gar uh, you know public place to protest the media is not going to carry any mm. news about mm. it. So understanding media was important. M media needed something that is, that is spectacle. Mm -hmm. Spectacular aspect is what the media needs and they can make news out of it. Mm. So therefore I climbed the building, the 30th floor building mm. up to the 14th floor from okay. outside mm. using the scaffolding mm. and hung myself with with the uh, with the build uh, laptop uh, strap and and strap myself to the scaffolding looks precarious mm, mm, from down below okay. for someone to mm, hang himself mm. from the 14th <laughs> floor but i was so meticulously mm. planned mm -hmm. uh, so i hung a free tibet banner 
uh, it's a red cloth banner written bold uh, free tibet in white paint all of this i arranged on my own personally mm -hmm. um so th what happened was the next day and that very day i was on tv everywhere uh, the news of it was the central front page news in almost about 180 newspapers around the world. Mm. Um, so in a way, you know, uh, this mm. news uh, stole the limelight from the Chinese the, Prime Minister. Mm. And mm. that was a tight slap uh, mm. against him. Mm. The issue got highlighted. Correct. If people in Bombay from those times, if you ask, they would always remember the guy who climbed mm -hmm. uh, the 14th floor mm -hmm. but they wouldn't know me you know mm -hmm. that i think is a success mm -hmm. so and from that day or year 2002 on a regular basis you do that whenever a high official of the chinese government visits india you yes. do that yes. in fact in april may i think vice asia and vice news <laughs> carry a wonderful news about you yes. it's around 16 17 yes, it's yes. wonderfully mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. your life mm -hmm. you've been arrested around 16 times yes how do the indian kind of policemen treat you when they take you into custody how is the treatment well the indian police um and also intelligence department we usually share a good rapport mm. uh, because they need information mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. tibet okay. they need information about the chinese activities so we share a lot of information mm. but the moment chinese president and prime minister mm. they come to india then we play uh, cat and mouse game okay. chor police mm. game shuru ho jata hai beach mein ab ab chinese aa gaye hain so um, then they try to uh, tell me and mm. i have to go underground go missing okay. mm. so we have this exciting and this is not just few days it's exciting one month uh, uh, story Mm -hmm. uh, because they would try to track me much much earlier than the Chinese mm -hmm. Prime Ministers mm -hmm. or President's visit and I would know this so I have to um, switch up my mobile phones and go to places mm -hmm. and it's constant uh, cat and mouse game um, and we never know who's going to win mm -hmm. at many places I won at many places they fault my game so mm -hmm. I got arrested much mm -hmm. earlier like like mm -hmm. the most recent uh, arrest was in mm -hmm. Chennai when Xi Jinping was coming to okay. Mahabalipuram mm -hmm. I got arrested 10 days before <laughs> Xi Jinping's before visit mm -hmm. and interestingly Xi Jinping did not announce his trip to India okay. only up to the last day mm -hmm. and that was a diplomatic pressure on India Mm -hmm. It seemed because India announced Xi Jinping's visit and Xi Jinping did not announce it. Mm -hmm. And just before him coming into India, the Chinese brought in PLA soldiers into Ladakh border. Mm -hmm. And India was in a tight situation that mm -hmm. there are Chinese soldiers into Ladakh border. Mm -hmm. They had to be thrown out. Then Xi Jinping was to come they were not announcing mm -hmm. and india had already announced it these kind of diplomatic pressures india had to suffer at that time mm -hmm. and now we see after galvan valley mm -hmm. massacre entire indian population for us we have recognized china as the enemy mm -hmm. you know earlier pakistan mm -hmm. now we understand that the real hands mm -hmm. behind pakistan terrorism is from china mm -hmm. So, the, all this is what I was saying mm. to Indian police. Deko, your enemy is China, not, not mm. two of us. We, Indian police and intelligence and we Tibetans, we should be working together. Correct. And um, even today, when I call the Indian police who arrested me, I tell them, I told you at the time, the real enemy is China, not mm. us. Then he, he loves, uh, you know. So, I share very good rapport with, okay. with the police. Mm. All the police officers who arrested me mm. either in Bangalore, Ahmedabad, Delhi, Bombay, Goa, Chennai, everywhere. Now we are friends okay. and I, I informed them about mm, Chinese before, activities. Right. So we share such good rapport. Mm. And um, during the time of the protest, they would be really? harsh. Mm. You know, they would pin me down and throw and, you know, twist my arms mm. and things like that. But once we are inside, 
Then we are friends. Mm. We have chai. Oh, police, give me mm. chai. <laughs> and we all sit down and we talk. Yeah. And they would tell me how they were preparing to mm. arrest me. Mm. And of course, I was absolutely disciplined in my ways of mm. working mm. to uh, get away from the police, uh, you know, in vigilance. Um, and once inside, we talk and we have such good rapport. Good. And then we keep in touch also. Okay. <laughs> So what about the story of the red robe? It started around 2002 only, I think. Ah, this uh, red represent? bandana. What does it represent? So this red bandana is a mm. symbol of my promise, the pledge I have taken for, for Tibet. Mm. I said, until and unless Tibet is not free, mm. I will wear it every day, mm. never take it off. Mm. And once Tibet is free, I will take it off, I will become citizen of free Tibet. Mm. So that's that's the signet that's the 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 sign, the symbol of this pledge. Mm. I took this pledge when I was in class five. Okay. I was in the five years when I was in the past when I was in the past I was in the past I was in the past So this pradigya, this pledge is what I hold uh, with me every day. Mm. And this promise inspires me. Mm. that I have a great purpose in life and that purpose is not for myself personally mm. is for the country and also for the idealism of non-violence mm. you know for 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 the Tibetans mm. non-violence is the basic principle of action mm. and for me uh, having uh, made this promise the non-violent freedom struggle for Tibet is the ultimate, uh, you know, advice from His Holiness mm -hmm. the Dalai Lama. And I'm always very excited that mm -hmm. we have such great leader mm -hmm. to follow. And I'm, uh, you know, a small, minute part of this mm -hmm. in the in the entire freedom movement. Mm -hmm. So you've been highly influenced by His Holiness, of course, the Protean yes. Dalai Lama. Yes. So you interact with him at a very personal level, also. Not really. <laughs> uh, could you share your thought about? The Dalai Lama that the world does not know because what we see is from the media, but he's supposed to be a very jovial, happy person, compassionate. Very like the moment you see him, I think goosebumps kind of emerge, you know. So, how is he like? Well, the interaction I, that you've had? I should say, you know, um, I'm actually no one to, uh, to mm. talk about it mm. personally because I don't really know him mm. personally. Okay. Um, I've had a uh, couple of opportunities to to see him and also listen to him uh, but I don't know him personally okay. uh, but how I look at it look at his mm. holiness the Dalai Lama personally is uh, that he is someone who is a great manager mm -hmm. and he manages everything with the overall principle of Karuna mm. so he manages Chinese pressure he manages mm. a very close diplomatic relationship with the government of India. Mm. As a Buddhist leader, there are a lot of pressures on him, mm. especially case, uh, questions on Burma, mm. Sri Lanka, right. you know, violence mm. that, are, that mm. happen. Although he has no way he could influence the administration either in Sri Lanka or in Burma, but he would be under pressure. Mm. And also being a Nobel Peace Prize winner, mm. there's always Overt, uh, mm. sometimes even unreasonable expectations uh, from him mm. to do certain things, mm. but as a ref ultimately he's a refugee. Right. He doesn't have a citizenship of any country. Mm. There may be ordinary mm. citizenship mm. like like the one from Canada or mm. or so from Italy, but he had been denied visas mm. to South Africa, mm. uh, South Korea, mm. Australia once, mm. and. As a Buddhist leader, he had been denied entry to all the Buddhist countries. Mm. He cannot go to Nepal, he cannot go to Bhutan, he cannot go to uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Laos, Cambodia, <laughs> Vietnam, Thailand. None of them would give entry to him. So, in a way, there is a lot of pressure on him. Uh, but he manages everything mm -hmm. with great sense of karuna mm -hmm. that he's never affected by Correct. that. Oh. This and in 2008, when the Beijing 2008 Olympics was going on, when Tibetans raised this protest 
and when the international uh, you know community put that kind of pressure on their own uh, governments presidents of france the uk uh, and the us they pressured on china mm. that they were considering not to attend beijing 2008 olympics mm. that was the time when his holiness said Be uh, that china deserves a good olympics mm. he was the only one supporting, supporting beijing mm. so this level of compassion mm. someone who would go beyond human emotions mm. and and think of perhaps happiness of a larger community and uh, has the capacity not to look at china as an enemy mm. but as ordinary human beings mm. who would also aspire for olympics in their country for the first time uh, so. that i think uh, you know makes his holiness unique from all the world leaders mm. and therefore uh, many of the indian leaders have said that that the avatar of the buddha the avatar of the gandhi if there is anyone in the world today it's his holiness the dalai lama mm. therefore he's always inspiring mm. for everybody mm -hmm. thank you. thank you for your share on his holiness the dalai lama the most compassionate being on planet earth you here on a special tour uh, featuring the documentary from the great escape of the dalai lama from tibet so can you also share some light on this the document yes so on this journey i've been um, screening this film so in a way it it has become um, a film travel mm. you know there there are people who have done film travels theater of travels mm. around the world and story travels mm. this is a film travel i've been uh, carrying this film with me with uh with a projector uh, a double bed uh, bed sheet mm. turned into a, a film screen a sound box um, and earlier we were three but now we are two people traveling using local transport and screening this film everywhere possible mm -hmm. up until now today for example is my 77th day of the screen on this on the okay. journey okay and we must have screened at least about 80 times mm -hmm. in so many different villages and towns and schools mm -hmm. and civil societies sometimes among groups of monks sometimes even to uh, police and army mm -hmm. also uh, so it's a long film journey this film is called escape of the dalai lama from tibet made by rangrez films based in bombay mm. for epic tv channel okay it was shot in uh, spiti valley mm. in the year 2015 and it was broadcast as a film on epic tv channel in mm. 2017 mm. but many people in the himalayas they've never seen they didn't have mm. epic tv connection so therefore we are doing this uh, film travel this film tells the story of tibet which then becomes a lesson to india about mm. Chinese expansionist mm. ideology. Mm. What uh, our Indian Prime Minister Modi ji often says, Chin ek vistar vaad desh hai. The expansionist idea. Mm. You know, India cannot understand that you know, we, would, we would always stay within the mm. boundary. Mm. China, for China, they have not only occupied Tibet, East Turkestan, Southern Mongolia, now eyeing Taiwan. Mm. Now they want to dominate the world. Correct and they have ambitions on india mm. and indian population cannot understand this mm. why would they cross the border into mm. india and want, mm. want to do anything but they've done and they are likely to do more mm. uh, trouble on india and i want indian people to understand mm. that chinese mm. expansionist mentality mm. and therefore i'm doing this uh, film travel mm. across the himalayas uh, in fact in february 2021 the day the tibetan new year yes. started mm. Mm. A 500 kilometers walk from Dharamsala to New Delhi. Yes. You started a uh, walk a mile for Tibet. Yes, yes. Can you also, you actually uh, trying to bring the Indian government's attention that you're not happy mm. with their embracing the one China policy. Yes. yes. So can you also tell me about this? Yes. Um, so this was uh, this year uh, uh, in the month of February when the Tibetan New Year. Uh, was happening on on the very first day of the new year what we call losar mm. and i started this uh, one man walk mm. 
okay. from Dharamshala all the way down through Punjab, Haryana and Delhi. It was uh, physically if you uh, measure is 500 uh, kilometers but when you actually walk mm -hmm. through villages and everything it becomes That's much cool. longer so anyway it took me almost about about a month mm -hmm. uh, in 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 walking uh, it was strenuous because mm -hmm. every day you're walking about 20 to 30 kilometers a day and um, uh, there are issues about heat and uh, having to walk on roadside, mm. you know, dangers of, you know, fast traffic on, on National Highway Number 1 mm. and, and all of that. But uh, I think the real challenges uh, were explaining the issue of Tibet mm. to Indian population mm. who had no idea. Correct. Mm. You know, and, and I used to tell them, um, uh, uh, walking, that Tibet had always been India's neighbor. Mm. Not China. Mm. Okay. Look at the entire history of India. You will not see any mention of China. Mm. It is Tibet. And Tibet is 25 lakh square kilometer of land. India is 32 lakh square kilometer of land. Which means Tibet is the size of two thirds the size of India. Mm. And most people cannot understand. People mm. usually think, Are Tibet Malavo. Uh, Nepal ke aspas choda desh ya Ladakh ke aspas choda desh. People usually think Tibet mm. is a small country, but Tibet is 2.5 million square kilometer of land. Mm. And uh, when China is 96 lakhs, 9.6 million square kilometer, so chi China is three times the size of India. Mm. And China is big because China has occupied Tibet, East Turkestan, mm. Southern Mongolia. And 60% of China's landmass is occupied country. Mm, so. Most Indians have no idea about mm. it. Mm. So it is important for me to walk every day for, for a month and educate and create this awareness. Mm. They understand. So therefore they will understand the importance of Tibet having to be recreated as a free and independent country which could then become a safe buffer zone between China mm. and India. And how that uh, role was played in the past, mm. in history. So that was the journey. Mm. Uh, and I called it Walk a Mile uh, for Tibet. Mm. And many people in, in solidarity with this march, mm. uh, many people uh, took uh, you know, special uh, activities in different other towns and cities around the world mm. as a token uh, march to create awareness in those local areas also. Mm. So you received a... An overwhelming response. Very good people, response, right? and especially from the media. Mm. Very the good coverage. Media. Is good. Yes, very uh -huh. good coverage. Yes. I almost forgot. Uh, you've been to Tibet only once, right after graduation, at around when you were around 22. If yes. Uh, you aspired to kind of visit mm. your mm. homeland. Mm. Uh, you also had, a, I think, a teaching stint in Ladakh. Mm. So you made attempts. You were arrested. Right. So how right. was your entry into Tibet? In fact, a Tibetan huh. nomad working for the Chinese. Got arrested. How was the feeling to be arrested by a Tibetan fellow Tibetan mm. in Tibet? Can you share well, the story? That was a very different story. It's not okay. a visit. It's not an entry. Mm. Mm. For me, after my graduation, I had made this decision on my own that there's no point saying free Tibet outside. Mm. I have to go inside mm. and fight. Yes. Mm. So I went to Tibet to fight China mm. alone. Alone you went. Huh? Yeah. So my idea was to cross the Ladakh border, go into Tibet, live among the nomads mm. and start a revolution. Mm. I don't know that at, at any point of time I could be arrested. Mm -hmm. At any point of time after the arrest I could be beaten or tortured or even killed. Mm -hmm. I knew but I went. Because I, at the time I understood that that was the only way. I was inspired by Subhash Chandra Bose. I was inspired by Bhagat Singh mm. and Gandhi. Mm. So I wanted to take action on my own. Mm. And I knew, just like uh, how Bhagat Singh said, my death with every drop of blood will give rise to a new revolutionary. Mm. Mm. That my life will go, but there will be hundred other revolutionaries rising to take the issue forward. I was inspired by such kind of thoughts. Mm -hmm. So therefore I went. went. 
and when I crossed into Tibet, I was successful in crossing the Indian border. Okay. Perhaps because I knew Indian police or Indian you know, structures well. But once I was inside, then I failed. I got arrested. Mm. Uh, uh, ultimate, of course, they were uh, Tibetan nomads working for the Chinese. Mm. And ultimately, it was the Chinese who arrested me and mm. beat me, blindfolded me, mm. tortured. And not only I was there in western part of Tibet, what you call Ngari uh, town, but I was taken to Lhasa. I was um, thrown into jail in Lhasa, uh, jail for three months. Mm. And they were trying to frame me as a possible Indian spy. Uh -huh. And they couldn't, they couldn't do it, even though they had informers in Delhi and also from Dharamshala. And when they failed to do that, then they used me to send me back to India to show that they care mm -hmm. about people who cross the border mm -hmm. uh, with no papers. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, it, it didn't work out. I had entire story of people have, having been arrested, beaten, tortured in, in Lhasa jail. I was able to tell all this, all those stories. Mm -hmm. So that was my uh, one very different ways of thinking and mm -hmm. action. Mm -hmm. um, but then, having thrown out of Tibet, then I had to settle uh, uh, to my second option, that is to work for Tibet from outside. Mm -hmm. So we was uh, we have Tenzing Shundu, a Tibetan poet, writer, freedom fighter and an activist that the world recognizes. So we've talked uh, enough about your activism. Thank you so much for sharing those things with our viewers, KTV. So you're also into writing. Uh, so you have around four books. In 1999, I think you started the first anthology of poems, yes. Crossing of Borders, Kora followed. And this one is the Shim Shok, how we pronounce Sem -shok. it? Shim -shok. That's Sem -shok. basically yeah. a collection of? Uh, essays. Essays. Yes. So, and I found it very really interesting the way you actually uh, publish a book. Uh, thanks for this book, Kora Stories and Poems by Tenzin Sundu. Thank you very much for getting me a copy of this. Mm -hmm. So, how do you actually get your books uh, printed? Because I think published is not available mm. anyway. If if I want to get it, I have to get it through you or your connection. Right. Friend. This is um, self-published uh, okay. books, and that. <clears throat> And I've been doing that for entire 16, 17 years. Okay. And this is my only source of income. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, uh, as an activist and also as, as a writer, I live a very s simple, minimalized mm. lifestyle. I'll come to that also. Okay. Mm. And uh, in publishing mm. this book, um, this is perhaps the cheapest book mm -hmm. in India on sale, mm -hmm. but also production also. This costs only 9 rupees okay, in production. In Dharamsala only. In Dharamsala, mm -hmm. there is a printing press where mm -hmm. I use this cheapest uh, paper. Mm -hmm. This is newsprint okay. uh, paper mm -hmm. and recycled also. Oh, recycled and this paper. is recycled handmade paper. Mm -hmm. And still looking, mm -hmm. you know, uh, great. In, mm -hmm. in, and also the feel of it. Mm -hmm. And the best part is the uh, reading of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is this is what I do, and and, and uh, this one so far sold uh, forty five thousand copies. Okay. So as a mm. book of poems, this mm. is perhaps the bestseller. Mm. So that you do it in Dharamsala itself. Yes, it's mm. it's entirely uh, Dharamsala production. Well, we were standing, Sundu combines his activism pretty well with his writing. So when you write these, uh, of course, these are directed at. Your activism that is related directly in some way, you write about Tibet, I think, yes. Yes. So, how does literature influence a movement like yours? Or you go on a reading spree at literary festivals yes. in yes. Gantok, you've been at the Rational Books. Yes. Uh, so, how does, how, how does your literature influence your movement? Well, I think, you know, there's a great connection between uh, writing and activism. Mm. Um, where the, actually if you look at the technicality of writing, you see, you are constantly composing a language, mm. a new language. Mm. 
a new language that can talk about the sentiment, the thought and ways and means of your activism. And activism is also a language. Language to explain, to tell the story and the thought to the world. Activism is also language. So you see, both are languages, but in different forms. And how poetry inspires me is when you are composing a poem, what you're doing is you are uh, resorting to imagination mm. to tell something that is not um, told in prosaic language. Mm. So you're using metaphors. Mm. You're using things that are not there or has not been imagined so far. You're creating something new mm -hmm. in poetry. Mm -hmm. And in activism, if you do the mundane, same daily action, people will be bored. Mm -hmm. They would not be inspired. Mm -hmm. They will not be joining you. Correct. So you see, poetry mm -hmm. inspires creative actions mm -hmm. which can create an impact and also following and great communication. Mm -hmm. So for me, poetry and political action that mm -hmm. I take are one and the same. Mm -hmm. And therefore I was able to, for example, climb the building from mm -hmm. outside and hang a banner from there. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a poetic action. Mm -hmm. You see, um, I do not look at them separately. Mm -hmm. Of course, one is physical action, okay. the other one is literal. literal. Um, the physical action is momentary. Mm. Okay, true. Literal mm. is documented and it's history mm. and is there forever. Mm. So you write only in Tibetan, but most of works have been translated in several languages. No, 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 no. I write only, only in English. Only. It's for the global audience, I think. That's I think that's how uh, I... Uh, planned uh, from from school time that I need to tell the world our story mm. I, and I need to tell the world our story in in my own composition mm. uh, and I've al always um, you know tried to encourage uh, younger Tibetans to write their own story mm. tell the tell their own uh, feelings your know, their emotions in in poetry or, or in in stories mm. uh, so telling your own story is Correct. so very important Absolutely. and i see that this entire region mm. Mm, that uh, the trista river mm. basin mm. Uh, kalimpong darjeeling gantok all throughout there are so many stories Correct. and um and these stories needed to be told uh, by your by yeah, yourself true. You know, telling your own story powerfully and in a creative manner mm. has always reduced. Mm. So true. I think everybody who wants yes. communication, conversation, yes. Yes. if the world needs to understand Tibet or any region, I think yes. the, the world needs to listen to our stories. And yes. you do that wonderfully yes. through activism, through writing. Mm. So since you're here uh, with Kalimpong Television, I request you, a humble request, to kindly uh, read one of your poems before we come to the end of the interview. Okay. One, one of the mm -hmm. poems, especially for the audience of KTV. Um, I'll read uh, from Kora uh, one short poem uh, called Horizon. <clears throat> and this is about journey. Um, we often take journey, we, we, we travel to some place and once you get there then you want to go to another place and uh, in, in general life also it's always like this, you want to finish your school, go to college, mm. get a job, get married, babies and bank balance and all, mm. all, 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 all of that. Um, so this may be a regular but I would always taken a different uh, strand of life. So this is about journey and it's called horizon. So and, and many horizons we pass by. From home you have reached the horizon here, from here to another, here you go, from there to the next, next to the next, horizon to horizon, every step is a horizon. Count the steps and keep the number, pick the white pebbles and funny strange leaves, 
mark the curves and cliffs around for you may need to come home again thank you so much thank you sundu for this wonderful recitation uh, so what next for you the coming years and of course i'll combine an additional question as well even as loneliness has kind of embraced the idea of having tibet's identity as an autonomous region within the china but does that make uh, a major part of the tibetans in particular the youth unhappy that a compromise has been met and it's even your activism is for freedom of tibet yes. so how do you see this well i think um Uh, you know my way of looking at uh, the proposal for autonomy is 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 it it's definitely a compromise mm. uh, i think uh, his holiness the dalai lama and also um, the tibetan government in exile uh, think that um, the proposal for autonomy is to to suit and adhere to government of india's policy where india looks at tibet as a part of china and also many other countries uh, who are dependent on chinese um, you know supply chain and trade and um, uh, and therefore kind of an uh, you know uh, speaking for independence may not mm-hmm. suit those policies mm-hmm. so i look at these as um, compromises mm-hmm. um, but i think you know these are these are policies designed for a certain uh, period of time mm-hmm. and certain policies mm-hmm. um ultimately you know who wouldn't want freedom okay. who would want to live under uh, foreign mm-hmm. occupation forever okay. no one mm-hmm. not even a single tibetan mm-hmm. and especially those tibetans who are living inside tibet mm-hmm. under the chinese occupation hum unke kaise batayenge ab hum chinese ke sath hamesha unke sath rehna nahi आजादी चाहिए सो देर फो आई हैव ऑलवेज बिलीव एंड ऑलवेज स्पोकन वेरी स्ट्रॉन्गली दैट द अल्टीमेट सोल्यूशन फॉर टिबेट इज इंडिपेंडेंस ऑफ टिबेट एंड वी वुड लाइक टू रिस्पेक्ट चाइना एज आर नेबरिंग कंट्री एंड देट ऑलवेज बीन आर नेबरिंग कंट्री वी हैव डेल्ट विद दम फॉर थाउजेंड ऑफ इयर्स एंड विथ डिग्निटी दे शुड लिव इन दे ओन कंट्री एंड नॉट ट्रांसग्रेस इन टू आर कंट्री and that would also be a huge resolution mm. between india and china mm. the dangers that the biggest population the biggest countries in the world are almost at war is not good for world peace right neither is good for china nor is for india mm. maybe for xi jinping in mm. order to maintain his own authoritarian dictatorship mm. there he may want to you know uh, rouse a warfare a war kind of a situation in order to uh, quell any kind of dissent within china mm. it may be useful for him mm. but india wouldn't want to enter into any war against anyone mm. so therefore ultimate resolution for tibet and for india for china is independence of tibet mm. only true an independent independence of tibet can truly guarantee the survival of tibetan religion culture mm. identity and the culture of non violence that we value so much right. and this will then recreate tibet as a safe buffer zone between india and china mm-hmm. but all these years you've always been saying it's not the indo china border problem in fact it's the indo tibetan border yes problem yes you've always said that yes yes you know very often when i go around people um, most indians you know just callously they they say china border china mm-hmm. because they they see the the chinese soldiers all across the border but it it is tibet border and because we have indo tibetan border police mm-hmm. if if that is china border then why would you have why would you have indo tibetan border police mm-hmm. yeah so it is there in in our infrastructure it's just the Uh, you know fear factor mm. yeah if you do not fear Ch- uh, fear china mm. then you should start saying tibet border mm. so we always said that yes uh, ktv a special presentation like it's so interesting the conversation i wish this could go on forever so before we close this interview with tenzik sundu tibetan poet writer freedom fighter and activist i have around two or three questions which i would like to ask you 
uh, recent headlines which which says that China recruits young Tibetans and People's Liberation Army to deploy them against India and the recent one which is also talked about the CPC leader Wang Jungjian if the pronunciation is correct accused of human rights violation against uh, Xinjiang mm -hmm. province. Yes. He is now the head of yes. the Tibetan yes. Tibet region. Mm. So your take on these two? Huh. Uh, firstly, the second question. Uh, Mr. Wang, Wang has been uh, now uh, made the head of Tibet. And uh, China has always used Tibet as a laboratory to practice brutality. Mm. Whosoever goes to Tibet is most cruel to the Tibetan population. Mm in order to prove that they are most loyal to Chinese Communist Party. Mm. And when you have done this, then you naturally gain ranks, mm. go higher in the hierarchy. Okay. And that's how Xi, Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping became presidents in China. Okay. They, they did what is called exemplary uh, you know, uh, loyalty to the uh, Chinese Communist Party, but what we ended up doing was brutality on the Tibetan people. Mm. And Mr. Wang is, is, is having that kind of mm. ambition to climb the ranks mm. just by being brutal to uh, the Uyghur people of East Turkestan, mm. what is now called Xinjiang, but mm. it's, it's actually East Turkestan mm. and now uh, coming to Tibet. Mm. So they will so China has always used Tibet as a laboratory to see mm. uh, how do we come about new ways of uh, stricter uh, invigilance mm. and, um, and uh, ways of torture. Uh, so they've used physical torture and also genocide. Mm. Destroying a unique culture in order to, in order to homogenize mm, okay, china's cool. idea is to make everybody in china and chinese occupied countries as chinese mm. now in tibet tibetan language is not taught mm. and they would say this is two language policy mm. where the focus is on chinese language mm. they they see that it is the Tib unique tibetan language culture yes. that is creating the real resistance not having for them to come out in the street mm. and protest but just the survival of language and culture gives tibetans a sense of identity dignity and a differentiation from tibetans and chinese mm. so they, they look at tibetan language and culture as an as the biggest obstacle against homogenization and very true like once you paralyze a community rob it of its yes. cultural yes. Identity, yes. identity through yes. genocide mm. That means the community kind of... What suffers. was your previous question? Uh, deployment of Chinese ah. recruits, young Tibetans. So I think, you know, uh, how I look at this is... Um, firstly, it's not that the PLA did not have Tibetans in, yeah, the, the, in the recruitment earlier. Okay. They had, mm. but it's a very small number. Mm. They would pick and choose someone who is really... Um, ideologically changed mm -hmm. those who would be recruited. What they're doing now is a direct response to India's special frontier force. Mm -hmm. We need to look at this. Mm -hmm. It's a strategized mm -hmm. response to India. Mm -hmm. Because India, in India, we have always been having special frontier force from 1962 onwards. Okay. And SF, SFF had the, the Tibetan body in the Indian uh, of uh, armed forces as a special category. They played some of the most important roles in all the uh, wars and battles India fought, mm -hmm. either in mm -hmm. Bangladesh okay. or in uh, Pakistan or against China. In all these, SFF played pivotal roles, mm -hmm. but all of them had been um, under secrecy. Mm -hmm. Last year, when the action happened uh, on the blacktop, that was the first time when there was a mention of it. And I would like to think that the government of India has changed its policy by highlighting it, mm. giving China a response mm. by using Tibetans. Mm, okay. And in order to respond to that, China has now started to recruit mm. officially 
politically mm. and by using it mm. as a, a, that as a propaganda mm. uh, tactic mm. to put pressure on India that now they have more numbers of uh, Tibetan soldiers. Mm -hmm. But the question is, will China trust these Tibetans mm -hmm. with firearms, mm. with bullets? Mm. I doubt. Mm. I doubt. Mm -hmm. India has always trusted the Tibetan soldiers mm. and gave them whatever weapons needed to tackle wherever possible, wherever is needed. Mm. But will the Chinese mm. really trust the Tibetans <laughs> uh, in, mm. in Tibet mm. with that kind of guns? Mm. Will they, what if they turn and fire mm. back yes. at them? Mm. So this may sound like a great um, propaganda mm. machinery. Um, but in reality, it's still doubtful. Mm -hmm. Will they trust the people they recruited? Or is it just for, uh, for, for camera? Is it just a great a PR exercise? Mm -hmm. uh, Tenjing Sundu is here with us. Uh, now we're almost uh, to the end of the interview. Uh, we're having a wonderful conversation. So whenever we talk about Tibet, Tibetan activism or life for the Tibetans, what next for the Tibetans? once his holiness realistically is not going to be here forever yeah. so what would life for the tibetans the tibetan cause tibetan yeah. activism be like after the departure of his holiness well see um, the issue of his holiness the dalai lama's next reincarnation is not tibet alone i think the resonance, the relevance of His Holiness's next reincarnation has much to do with India, mm. with the United States, mm. with China, and now Quad and AUKUS mm. and many other mm. international forums are coming about to tackle China. Mm. United States for the first time is now using the issue of East Turkestan mm. and Tibet, Hong Kong and Taiwan. Mm. They are finding it useful, not because they love these causes, but because they know that these are useful against China. Mm. They never dealt with China with these kind of hostility. They always uh, dealt with China as a partner. In fact, the economic and military rise that China has seen was always supported by the United States. Mm. United States created China to this level. Mm. Today, the United States has to fight its own ghost, just like the United States did in Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, everywhere. So, and this is no, no, no different. And because China has come to this level, many international bodies and also countries are having to deal with China uh, with, with, with such difficulty. And I think if the issue of Tibet is not resolved and if His Holiness passes here, passes away here in India, then I think many other countries will take interest in the future recognition, recognition of, the, of the future Dalai Lama because this would mean that, that the, Dalai, the Dalai Lama who, who is so much loved, respected and worshipped by Tibetans inside Tibet Mm. outside, people in the Himalayas mm. and people around the world. Mm. It's such a powerful mm. position and, and it's a position perhaps more influential than many governments. Correct. Mm. The two mm. against China in the context of this. So therefore, I would think uh, the way His Holiness the Dalai Lama um, is functioning now and also in future will have huge influences in many countries. Mm -hmm. So you may be asking this mm -hmm. question to a Tibetan, mm -hmm. but I think it's a very, very big international and complex mm -hmm. issue. Uh, but ultimately, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has said, and people around the world had always supported him. The issue of the Dalai Lama's reincarnation is purely mm -hmm. the Dalai Lama's issue. And he alone will decide mm. how, where, and when mm. he will be born. Correct. But his Holiness himself has said, 
But who is worried about the next uh, Dalai Lama? I am very much here and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm healthy. I think these are great uh, you know, signs from his side mm-hmm. to say that, that the confidence of living a longer life mm-hmm. and he had even challenged um, CCP. Mm-hmm. Let's see who lives longer, the Dalai Lama or the Chinese Communist Party. Mm-hmm. I think these, mm-hmm. are, these are great challenges His Holiness is throwing at China. Um, because Chinese Communist Party is celebrating 70th year th- uh, this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Russian, uh, so former Soviet Union, the Communist Party of, of, of Russia uh, came to an end on the 79th year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we do not know how long the CCP will last and all the belligerence and hostility China is showing to the international community is not because they want a war against others but they want to keep their own people under control by threatening to them mm-hmm. if we do not unite among ourselves there are enough enemies on the outside. and. Who knows, the, the next step for, for China may be an attack on, on Taiwan. Mm-hmm. Just to keep their own people within and less criticism against uh, Xi Jinping. Mm-hmm. So it's a big international uh, issue mm-hmm. and we'll have to see how this is going to uh, pan out. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, you know, one thing is that the Dalai Lama's reincarnation is purely the Dalai Lama's decision mm-hmm. and Tibetan people will always uh, respect this and all the Dalai Lama's followers will also respect this. Um, countries like India and United States, mm-hmm. uh, for them the future of Dalai Lama is very important mm-hmm. for their own foreign policies. Mm-hmm. And uh, China of course has been already signifying, uh, telling other people that they will uh, have their own Dalai Lama. Uh, but that's immaterial. Mm. You have some something where there are no followers. Mm-hmm. You know, what's the what's signif- significance right. anyway? So Tenzin Sundu, a poet of great eminence, activist, and so we already introduced. Uh, one thing I like about you is also like Chaba was also telling me you're a very simple person. You kind of follow the concept of minimalism, very less clothes. In fact, no attachment. That's what you see in most interviews. Uh, you're a part of the Friends for Tibet movement in India. You've also been associated with Tibetan Youth Congress, that's TYC. TYC. So we wish you all the best for whatever you do for your community and for the world community. Because you travel so much, I think it's more than Tibetans at time. You have lots of Chinese friends, Indian friends. And Kalimpong, the place where where we are taking your interview, in the 50s and so on, mm. even before that, you know that Indo-Tibet route mm. and so on. Mm. So very, even China does not, in a way, like Kalimpong, always featured mm. in one of the notorious yes. Yes. places where yes. uh, Tibetan movement kind yes. of started. Yes. Yes. So what would your, uh, not message, but how would you like to address the people of Kalimpong, in particular watching this mm. exclusive interview, a key TV presentation? Uh, but <laughs> Kalimpong has always been the capital of Tibetans outside Tibet. Even at the time when Tibet was free and independent, Kalimpong always used to have uh, the base for uh, independent Tibet. We used to have a uh, trade delegation. We had storehouses for wool Mm -hmm. that uh, Tibet used to uh, store in Kalimpong and take it through Siliguri all the way to Calcutta uh, and then export it to the UK. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the most important uh, factory products that the Tibetans use, whether it's a khata or the glass noodles or the incense sticks, um, uh, churpi, chura, uh, eatables, many of the, um, you know, uh, stuff people use for their ritualism, all of them had always been produced in Kalimpong. Mm. Kalimpong uh, centers Bhutan to the west, uh, Nepal, Tibet, Bangladesh, and of course the entire India. Uh, and they're to a mix of Bengali, Sherpa, Tamang, 
Gurung, Lepcha, Denjongba. Kalimpong is the hotbed of that mm. and right in the middle. Mm. And therefore, if Kalimpong is rich and melting pot of cultures, mm. Kalimpong also had uh, perhaps the busiest space for uh, international intelligence spies also lived mm. here. Mm. Um, and for Tibetans, Kalimpong had always been the capital outside Tibet. Mm. Even though we have uh, the central Tibetan administration, the Tibetan government exile based in Dharamchala and mm. also Isolin is there. I think in future, Kalimong will always be uh, enjoying this very space mm. as, uh, as the capital of diaspora Tibetans, mm. even in future, okay. because the proximity to Tibet mm. from here and the trade routes. Mm. Uh, in, in the past, people of Kalimpong, Darjeeling, Siliguri, Gantok used to freely travel into Tibet. Mm. And Tibetans also used to come down. In fact, today there are many families living in all these regions who are, who are divided. Some of their family members are in Tibet, some are here. So Kalimpong had always see, had seen mm. the partition. An unseen, unrecognized partition mm. of families mm. half in Tibet, yes, half here. Yes. So Kalimpong is as much uh, Tibet, as much we could see um, the people and cultures inside Tibet also. Mm. So that kind of fluid uh, grey area zone uh, between Tibet and Kalimpong. And I think Kalimpong, Kalimpong will continue to enjoy this uh, uh, space mm -hmm. and a unique relationship mm -hmm. and I would like to think that once Tibet is free and independent we will recreate this brotherly relationship between uh, Tibet and Kalimpong. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much uh, Tenzin Sundu for giving your time and may your campaign gather immense momentum in the days to come walking the Himalayas so from here you move to different parts of the Northeast yes. And may your campaign bear fruit and may you continue to write. Thank, Thank you. you so much Thank for you. your presence. Thank you. Our viewers, in today's episode, we featured a person of international prominence, the Tibetan writer, poet, freedom fighter, and an activist that the world recognizes. And thank you very much for your time. In the next episode, we'll see you. Thank you very much.